This is the Discovery Files podcast from the U.S. National Science Foundation. I'm Nate Potker. From prehistoric stone tools to modern-day silicon semiconductors, materials have served as critical building blocks for the technologies that people depend on every day. But some new materials are developed to address a certain need. Every year, over 6 million people get infections that develop into biofilms. This class of infection can be difficult to treat with antibiotics and result in over 200,000 deaths and billions of dollars in medical expenses every year. We are joined by Amber Dorian, Assistant Professor in the Department of Electrical and Biomedical Engineering at the University of Vermont, who is developing new materials for use in a variety of medical applications, including as biofilm-resistant wound dressings. Professor Dorian, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. So i like to start with a little bit of background to kind of ease into things. Can you tell me how you first got interested in biomedical engineering? Absolutely. I think, um, you know, one of the strongest influences on my life has been my dad, uh, because when I was growing up, he was always building something or fixing something around the house. And that really created just a, a underlying interest in me for solving problems. And when I was in high school, I really got in, involved and excited about science and math. And when it's time to apply to college, I was encouraged to uh, look at engineering. And I really, to be honest, didn't understand what an engineer was. I ended up working in someone's lab over the summer and uh, got experience and, and exposure to biomedical engineering, applying the principles of engineering to medical problems and, and problems of biological relevance. And that just, you know, sparked for me. I got excited. The, the person that was leading the lab was uh, very supportive and actually took me to my first conference and allowed me to present some of the research that we had been working on. And through that mentorship, I was, um, it, you know, able to then go and explore all kinds of different uses for biomedical engineering and further my studies in grad school beyond that. Absolutely. So one of the problems you're working on right now is biofilms. And I think we need to set up what a biofilm is for somebody who doesn't no. Yeah. So biofilms are basically a different way for bacteria to grow. So bacteria that we're all used to envisioning, we kind of think of them as floating around or swimming, you know, in some sort of uh, liquid, but they can also attach to a surface. And when they attach to a surface, they kind of create this really nice, happy home for themselves, this environment that's protective for them. And that surface can be something like a the surface of a wound. If you have an injury and it's healing, the bacteria can attach to it and uh, adhere to that surface and create a protective environment for themselves, which is not necessarily good for the person with that healing wound. Um, they can also attach to surfaces of medical devices, things like catheters, um, or uh, heart valves, things like that, that are indwelling or inside the body. So biofilms present a really large problem for treatment. When the bacteria attach to that surface, they're just much harder to treat. They create kind of a slime um, environment for themselves to live in that makes it hard for antibiotics to get to the bacteria. It makes it hard for cells of our immune systems to get to the bacteria. So they're really a challenging problem uh, biomedically for us to face. So is there anything about the, I guess, the services they attach to that make it more appealing for them as the destination? Like, how does it just go from something that's out in the environment to kind of taking hold? Sure. So that's uh, really kind of complex. And, um, you know, what surface they pick is uh, certainly an area of active research and something that we're trying to understand so that we can avoid them attaching to the medical devices that we design, for example. Um, but they can essentially attach to any surface and that that can happen, you know, if someone has an implant placed in their body, that could happen immediately or it could happen years down the line. Um, so the surfaces that they attach to can look like a bunch of different things and, and really be medically relevant in a bunch of different situations. Once they attach to that surface, that's when the problem really starts. You know, we, we all have bacteria in our bodies and they actually perform really important functions in our bodies. 
But the problem starts when they start to grow unchecked, uh, when there are too many bacteria in certain situations, or when they've attached to a surface or an area that's trying to heal, that becomes a, a really big problem. So you mentioned that they can be resistant to treatments. Um, can we explore that a little bit? What are the challenges treating biofilms? The bacteria in the biofilm mode of growth are really difficult to treat because they've created an environment where they can communicate with each other, um, pass signals around that are going to help them avoid things like antibiotics. Um, they become much more tolerant to higher levels of antibiotics. So, for example, a lot of biofilms are up to a thousand times more tolerant to antibiotics than a normal infection would be. And we can't just give a patient a thousand times more of that antibiotic. It becomes toxic right. at, at some point. And so, um, you know, therefore we have to pick other ways to treat these infections or use more aggressive antibiotics. Um, and depending on the type of bacteria species that are in the biofilm, because that's something I haven't mentioned yet, but there can be a bunch of different bacteria in a single biofilm, um, it, it can become an even more complex uh, problem to face in a uh, you know, hospital setting. Um, trying to treat these types of infections becomes very challenging. And it's also harder for our own immune cells to fight these infections because there are so many of these bacteria that are packed in one place um, and, and protected from those immune cells. So the approach you're taking is using wound dressings. Can we talk a little bit about how wound dressings have been used to date? Like, is there anything like connecting the dots with your process there? Absolutely. So wound dressings, you know, historically, obviously have been used for a long time, maybe just a piece of fabric or uh, when gauze was developed, you know, that was uh, used as a wound dressing for a very long period of time and still is. Um, more advanced wound dressings have tried to create environments of that wound. Say if we're talking about a topical wound, say someone's had a burn injury or a traumatic injury, um, the skin is broken and that creates a place where bacteria and other environmental factors can come into the body, creating lots of problems for that patient. And so a wound dressing creates a protective barrier between the outside of the body and, and the inside of the body. And it also is providing a healthy environment for healing. For most wounds, that looks something like keeping the wound moist enough in order for that healing process to happen. If it completely dries out, that sometimes inhibits healing. And there's a lot of variation across different types of wounds in terms of the best um, healing environment. But wound dressings in general are intended to protect that healing process, keep things outside of the body that are supposed to stay outside, and protect that healing process as it's happening inside the body. So what is different about your wound dressings here? So wound dressings are fantastic for all of those reasons that I just named, but they also have a high incidence of themselves becoming colonized with bacteria. So bacteria in the wound uh, or from around the wound can start to attach to that wound dressing too. So even though the wound dressings are certainly part of the solution, they also can become part of the problem when they now are infected with bacteria. They need to be changed out. Uh, uh, you know, on a more frequent basis and can contribute to a uh, poor health situation for the patient. So what we've tried to do is create a wound dressing that essentially is an anti-biofilm wound dressing where it inhibits the growth of the bacteria both on the wound dressing and helps the wound itself um, uh, avoid the bacteria as well. So we're trying to help the patient heal by preventing the wound dressing itself from becoming attached to bacteria, uh, which would make the situation much worse for the patient. Our approach to this relies on eliminating what essentially is an energy source for the bacteria. Some of the nitty gritty of how the bacteria grow in these biofilms um, has to do with forming these more complicated geometries when they grow together as a collective group of cells. And because of that complex geometry, some of those cells have access to oxygen and some do not. 
the ones that don't have access to oxygen, they need other sources or other ways to make energy from themselves, for themselves. And so uh, our approach is to eliminate one of those energy sources. And it turns out that that helps to inhibit these biofilms. It actually can both prevent the biofilms from starting and treat the biofilms if they're already established. So by incorporating some of those approaches into our wound dressing, we can cut down on the bacteria, even being able to start a, a biofilm on the wound dressing itself and help treat the potentially already established biofilm that's in the wound. Absolutely. And part of that development, um, you've got an NSF career award. So I, I definitely have to ask you about this. Can you tell me about what it means to get an award like that and how will it impact your work? The NSF career award is instrumental in sponsoring both this research and my development in my own career, my ability to be both an educator and a researcher, um, and balancing those two halves is really brought together through this award. So I am extremely grateful to the NSF for being able to uh, conduct my research in this area and hopefully over time develop a successful wound dressing product. Um, but they're also supporting my ability to educate, so offer specialized classes in materials design as well as outreach product um, projects, outreach projects to our uh, local community. We have some projects going on where we're working with middle school aged uh, girls and non-binary individuals, where they're getting exposure to engineering principles in middle school, which is something you know I, I told you I didn't have any idea what an engineer right. was when I was starting college. So it's uh, you know these folks are getting a chance to experience some of those ideas. Um, much younger than than I did and have an understanding of what an engineer does and the engineering design process. And so that's another part of this project that I'm really proud of and excited to continue to work on. And the NSF Career Award um, is enabling all of that work that really spans, you know, my career interests, both in education and in the research. I'd love to hear more about the outreach end of it. Um, what has your experience been like in those classrooms? Um, what kind of activities are you doing? How, how, uh, how much are you seeing it capture people's imaginations when it really has a context? Yeah, so it's um, very much thrilling to be in the classroom and see the middle schoolers get their hands on things. You know, at first they may be timid about um, approaching a new design. We have them do things essentially from uh, you know, craft supplies and and tubing and some low level hands on materials, and we challenge them to design uh, things like bridges or a water filtration system or a prosthetic device. And in you know an hour or two, they can dive in and understand enough about the problem to make a prototype towards a solution. And what they're learning is the steps of the design process, which involve things like identifying the problem, uh, designing an initial solution, and then iterating on that design and testing it to see how well it's working and adapting to that in your design process. Um, another neat part of this outreach, so we're working with Vermont After School, who actually conducts the um, training for the middle schoolers. And uh, a part of the project that I'm really excited about building out is that the folks that are in the classroom doing the teaching are actually college students. So what I do as a professor at the University of Vermont is I help the college students get prepared to then go out into our community and do this mentorship in the classroom with the middle schoolers. So these college students need skills that help them teach, help them connect with the students yep. and themselves understand the engineering process to the point that they can teach it. And so enabling those college students to then be able to go out and do that outreach in our community is a really key part of the process. Absolutely. That's fantastic. Um, you, you talked about developing the product a little bit. And I, I, I think the last thing specifically about the wound dressings, I'd like to explore a little bit what your next steps are as you try to build it towards a commercial product. Like for people who don't know how this process might go, what do you need to do still before this could be on the shelf somewhere? 
So the development process is a long one. Uh, we need to understand the science of how the bacteria work in order to enable the design of the wound dressing. Past that, we need to do all kinds of characterization to make sure that the wound dressing is strong enough to perform in a clinical setting, to make sure that it's going to hold up if it is sitting on a shelf for a month or two. And uh, then we need to test it with uh, cells to make sure that it's performing correctly. We need to test it with uh, animals in order to make sure that the processes still hold up when we go and apply it to infection settings. And all of that needs to happen before this design would ever reach a clinical setting. Um, our hope is uh, to be able to develop a lot of this in our university lab and then start a small company or partner with a small company in order to work on some of those later phase testing steps because that is a massive undertaking and uh, making sure that you have enough data so that this is a safe product that's effective for patients is very key at those stages. So we're still in early days in terms of understanding how it works, how the mechanisms of the bacteria work, whether or not we can put together these building blocks in, into a functional design. Um, but we certainly hope to one day um, you know, be creating our own company a couple years from now in order to bring this product to market. Special thanks to Amber Dorian. For the Discovery Files, I'm Nate Potker. Discover how the U.S. National Science Foundation is advancing research at nsf.gov.